Strange Yarn Ride is a show about people, places, and things in the great Northwest. People doing things a little left of center, making things uniquely their own. And you're going to find in this little journey that some of those things come from deep down inside of us. I'm Regan Lane. And I'm Raymond Hayden. And this is Strangely All Right. Our guest today has a great rock and roll story. It's one of self-destruction, second chances, and redemption. JAA, Mr. Jefferson Angel, the front man, singer, songwriter, and guitarist for two of the coolest rock bands in the area. Missionary Position and Walking Papers. Will be here talking with us today. In honor of the groovy Les Paul that he plays, we're going to go on inside to uh, the guitar store in T-Town, Guitar Maniacs, and have a little visit with them. Ready to do this, Ray? Let's do it. I'm psyched. Come on, everybody. Jefferson Allen Angel, nicknamed Junior and JAA, was born on February 13, 1973 in Tacoma, Washington. He's an American musician best known for his songwriting, lead vocals, and guitar playing in the alternative rock bands Post Stardom Depression, The Missionary Position, and Walking Papers. Post Stardom Depression signed to Will Records in the year 2000. They later signed with Interscope Records, but complicated business matters led the band to sign with the Control Group in 2003. They recorded two more records and disbanded in 2008. After PSD, Angel began playing a Thursday night residency at a club in Seattle with Benjamin Anderson. Those lounge nights were billed as the missionary position. In 2009, they recorded and released Diamonds in a Dead Sky. In 2012, Jeff recorded an album that features Barrett Martin, Duff McKagan, and Mike McCready. The new lineup, called Walking Papers, released their first album in October 2012. Nice. Pink Floyd, that's actually my favorite band, hands down. Yeah. One of the albums, that's great, it's a great bass. Yeah, if they keep it up, they might have a future. They have, yeah, they might. You know they have an album coming out in October. Yeah, it's a blasphemy. Blasphemy. It is, isn't it? Well, it can always be compared to Dark Side of the Moon. Mm -hmm. So, hey, um, congratulations on your success with The Walking Papers. Europe, one of my favorite rock bands, Aerosmith. What was that like? Ah, it was, you know, it's unreal. Who knows? It's like, a, um, you know, you got the key to the city there, you know, it's a pretty cool place to be. I Do guess you get to hang out with the guys a lot? No, uh, when you're an Aerosmith, you don't hang out. You know, oh. you don't have young upstarts coming up to, you know, tell you how awesome you are. It probably gets old after a while. Right. But um, I'm, Steven Tyler told me I was a snappy dresser one time. That was pretty cool. And he watched us play a couple times. I seen him lurking in the shadows. Nice. Are, are you guys going to go back over to Europe anytime soon? Um, I think right now we're uh, making good strides on making another record and uh, we've been there five or six times so it's been uh, I think we're we need to finish another record have a reason to go back you know sure mm -hmm. one of the coolest things about Europe is the food did you uh, did you guys get a chance to eat a lot but who doesn't want some gelato you know what I mean sure sure I'll take some gelato and I can't, I can't get enough of that I'll, I'll eat my weight in gelato if I can that's a lot of gelato So I'm not going to beat around the bush. Mm -hmm. You play with one of the guys that was in one of the biggest rock bands in the world at one time. Yeah. And it appears that you and Duff are friends. Yeah. And how did that re relationship evolve? He came to a rehearsal, so I just got off work, and there I was to rehearse, and he was sitting on the floor watching us practice, which is pretty weird. You know? Did, and he, br did he bring friends. you up for the Velvet Revolver gig? I went down and, uh, well, he gave me some, I, I went over to his house and he got, let me choose a few. And so I wrote lyrics and stuff. And then I went down there and I actually played with them and Slash and Iz Izzy and Duff and, um, and uh, Matt. And so I, for a couple of days in L.A. And I have recordings of it. And I, I didn't leak the demos. A bunch of the mm -hmm. people took the demos and were leaking them. And so they had a big thing in Rolling Stone about all these guys that tried out, and I don't even think some of the guys actually were legit. I mean, we yeah. trusted each other, and so it's like, and then later he had offered our band some shows with uh, Velvet Revolver. He was involved a little bit in your recovery. And I got a lot of phone calls from cool people, and Duff was one of those people that were nice, really su supportive, and a lot of people came out of the woodwork and were like, 
hey man, are you sane? Yeah, you know? yeah. So I had I had a similar experience like that where people stopped answering those phone calls, mm -hmm. and uh, so I guess the question that while you're talking to me is, what was the consequence that finally took you to say, you know what, enough's enough? Well, I could see where it was going. You mm -hmm. know, I was mm -hmm. I was a pretty hard drinker, drink in the morning, and I would sneak booze at lunch and mm -hmm. go out, and then um, then I started to see you know, pills and other things started to add up like that. And I was like, man, if I don't, I was hiding booze and all sorts of shit. And if I, I could see me doing the same thing with other things, if I didn't become a mess, they were like, you used to do that elegantly wasted thing really good. And, <laughs> and then you became pathetic. Some guys were telling me, you know, they were like, ah, we were avoiding your phone calls. Like we would get phone calls from you and we would avoid the phone calls. And it was like, not, not because anybody didn't think you were talented, but because you just become a mess. So Jefferson, inspiration, man. Who, who, who inspires you? You know, when I was a kid, I was really first by the radio, but I, I like stories and songs. And then I like, uh, you know, I grew up on some butt rock, but I started, the police were my first. Love the police. Yeah, the police and the cure were the first stuff that I heard on the radio that I went out and bought records. But then somehow, uh, due to my environment, it turned into Black Sabbath, ACDC, and Def Leppard, I guess, was the thing at the time, and then um, Heart albums or something. Those so, are great albums. But, um, but then nowadays, I actually am more really inspired by photography, and um, like, <laughs> and uh, I have a few friends of mine that are like do different art forms, and they're the funnest to talk to because you know you get doing something so long and you get stuck in your own rut. So they thinking about creativity in a different way and so that it's challenging I admire and respect how good they are they are so there's no competition I'm not trying to be right. a painter but then they and they love music but then they'll have different opinions on music or I will on their art or performance art or whatever and so we have those are the most inspiring conversations yeah. I had to have have you seen the movie or the the, the documentary uh, it might get loud with Jimmy Page? I have Jim. I saw that in a the theater how, how could you how could I not I had yeah. to go see that there's some I met Jimmy Page then. did you really I did what was that now what was that like it was really fast <laughs> <laughs> how you doing it was nice to see you well the our booking agent in Europe is is really good friends with him and his book Booking agent, and it's funny is the booking agent has hung out with him a couple times, and they were in this thing, and I was like, so you can like kind of say like you're friends with Jimmy Page, like he knows your name, right? And he's like, no, I can't say that. And I was like, you totally can, like you can just say you're buddies with Jimmy Page, you know? Well, you know, and, Regan I was, and I are going to do that with you. Yeah. After the interview, it's going to be like, yeah, what, Jefferson Angel, he's my best friend. So he was watching this show, the band in a uh, mezzanine thing, and so we got, got to sit in the same little. You know, it was like where Lincoln gets shot kind of thing, you know, a little booth. So we got to sit in there and watch the show. And then after the show, uh, you know, he's just we went backstage to tell the band how awesome they were. And there's Jimmy Page standing there. And so he's like, I try not to bug famous people. You know sure. what I mean? I, and I, quote, frankly, I'm more impressed by famous places like Guitar Maniacs. Absolutely. That, that has so much more. It has a. You know, all these things have happened in maybe say Hansa Studios in Berlin. Sure, I would sure. rather go to Hansa Studios than have lunch with David Bowie. That's just how my mind works. But um, so Jimmy Page was there, and there he, I got to play. My friend has Jimmy Page's guitar that he played when the levee breaks on it. Oh, really? And so I actually got to play his guitar forever, and that was kind of more fascinating sure. than meeting Jimmy Page because meeting Jimmy Page was like, hey, how you doing? I was like, you're Jimmy Page. I'm Jimmy Page. Nice, I'm like, to, meet nice you. to meet you. Okay. Do you talk like that too? I am Jimmy Page. Yeah, he's, I, he actually, that's my impression of Jimmy Page is like, my English accent, I've been practicing all these accents because we go to different countries and so I got German down pretty good. It's like, hi, I'm German. <laughs> <laughs>
giving up and like let's just play with my friends and who cares who's the most talented and who's the and so by giving up things started to happen for us because we were really just not aiming to please anybody but ourselves so it's a good time but we had you know we did a lot of stuff D DIY for sure in in a really cool healthy way and um, so it was a really fun release you know but I, we did it we had some people toured with us and filmed an entire tour and I watched the tapes it's like and uh, recently I've been hanging out with a couple of those guys and it's been pretty funny is that we talk to each other in such a brutal way that one time we had a producer come in to talk to us and he was like he's like I'm gonna step out guys let you guys work this out and he was like we we're like what are you talking about and, but because we were always like you know like you, you're dragging the beat, bitch. What, what the hell's wrong with you? And so it would all be very aggressive. That's how you know you love each other. Yeah, but it was actually to a point where I actually have learned over the time that I think we actually were, it wasn't healthy. It was that, a lot of things about post and depression wasn't healthy. You grew up in Tacoma? I did. T-Town? Tacoma, back and forth, Tacoma and Spokane. Yeah. Yeah. Cut the kids in half. That's what they do. Yeah. You know. Go to high school where? Where didn't I go to high school in Tacoma? <laughs> I figured out that uh, they had this thing, if you missed more than 14 days in school, they would, uh, you got automatically failed. So I'd miss about 12 and then I'd just transfer to a different high school. Fair so enough. I, I worked the system. How old were you in your first band? Ah, uh, well, I was probably 13, 14, 13. Something like that. A bunch of bad band names. For don't, example, don't remember those bad band I remember names. them. Yeah, <laughs> you're just not gonna say it. Yeah. So you 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 have you have kids? I do. I have two daughters. The best thing ever happened to me. It's funny how you can make the worst decision of your life and then end up with the best results. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I bet they're big fans. They could care less. They could care. Right. They could totally care less about any music. I think they think music's something that dumb adults do oh my gosh you know i mean i don't think i understand I had a clear perspective of what love really is until i had a my first kid you know unconditional love of you know that you you know throw yourself in front of the bus for them kind of thing it changes priorities yeah so you so you mean that when you're on tour with a missionary position with the walking papers you guys don't build sandcastles and nah, play nah. in the surf it's <laughs> actually it's more childish there than it is with my kids <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. Yes. So I'm curious. You said that the music is thing that dumb adults do, but yeah, do, I mean, they, do they play at all? Do, I mean, have they ever played an instrument? Well, or? you know, I mean, I think that music, it's, I gave them both piano lessons until the piano teacher was like, you know, I was like, I don't I think you're more torturing your kids than <laughs> helping them. You know, music, I figure if they'll, if they'll come around in music, they both like music, but they like music in their own way. And I think music is a thing definitely that you can't, forcing on people usually has adverse effects. You know, I mean, people got to come around it to their own self. And it's, the more I can figure out about, you know, it's kind of like in a relationship, it's not the person that you can live with, it's the person that you can't live without. I think people that make good musicians are people that can't not do it. You know what I mean? They can't imagine not playing It's not music. a choice. Yeah, you have no choice. And so I don't know that my kids have that. Although they can appreciate and like the music that they like, I don't know that they have that natural, like, just desire to, be part of playing music and so well, I don't want to force it on them you know I mean if they if they come around and want something want to play music or learn us I'll you know sure I'd help them out but I, it doesn't bother me at all that they're not they're not there but yeah well, they, they both have good they're gonna have their in their own, own way you know my one daughter loves Eminem and uh, Odd Future and a lot of hip hop which I like a lot of the lyrics in that stuff and then my other daughter like soundtracks like hmm. Ennio Morricone and uh, God and, Frozen, uh, Angelo Badalamente and stuff like that. You know, if you don't mind me jumping back in, you made me think of something. You know, Regan asked you, you know, your first band and stuff, mm -hmm. and then you you're talking about this whole thing, which a lot of us uh, know is it's not really a choice. And it, so, when did you know? When was that for you that you oh, knew uh, that it was it wasn't something you chose to do? My my mom. Um, when you're a single mom of a couple. Uh, boys or whatever it's probably it's you get your dating circle shrinks down real quick and uh so she was dating an elvis impersonator when i was a kid <laughs> and he could play guitar and you know and do the whole thing and he gave us a 45 of uh heartbreak hotel 
And so when I was a kid, we had have a 45, a Heartbreak Hotel, and we also had Glenn Campbell's The Rhinestone Cowboy. And But in our school, these kids would all play with KISS cards. They all had KISS cards, but I'd never heard KISS. But like when you're a kid, the image of KISS with all the makeup and stuff is pretty powerful. And, but they had guitars. So like I think in our world, we, imag- we would put on Heartbreak Hotel, but we had imagined KISS playing it. And we'd never heard KISS. And uh, But I the stories in, uh, you know, Heartbreak Hotel and the Rhinestone Cowboy to me are really like, you know, the stories in the songs just take you right there. You can visualize what's in the song. And um, so I really like what a song leaves to your imagination. It just triggers your imagination. And a good song will allow you to, your imagination to run wild with that. that I know wanted me to ask this question and you went through that dark period we talked about it mm-hmm. or whatever uh, the, it was just I it's asked, called night <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah so for some of us the night is a little longer and darker but people uh, tell me they're like you, you look like you got dressed in the dark they tell <laughs> yeah. me that all the time but did you lose faith in yourself you know I mean I, I didn't well, it's not, it wasn't so much I lost faith in my Self or more that I was becoming somebody that I didn't want to be, you know. That's the thing. If you know, you know, some of if you got some, you know, I most people get a lot of faith in themselves if they have a forty ouncer. You yeah. know what I mean? That's yeah. the problem. Is it? But it's artificial faith. It's not based on a yeah. reality. But I think I was distracted. So it's not that I lost faith in myself. It's a, more that I was distracted by other things. That uh, so I was just chasing them. You know, I think that's a problem with a lot of people. They get distracted. People are distracted. And sometimes it's just growing up. I found that, you know, I had to go through some stuff to appreciate what I have and, and to be where I'm at now. I mean, everything's different for everybody. But um. Yeah, I mean, hey, if you get faster. I, I'm not against someone experimenting. Wait until you're an adult and you know who, you, you know, so many people are, like, in a hurry to get somewhere that they think they're going, but they should be in a hurry of trying to figure out who they are. Yeah. And then maybe they'll have a better idea of where they're going. So it's like, yeah, if somebody wants to, you know, experiment with those things, and some of our most greatest creative minds did, you know what I mean? Would If Hemingway didn't slug a, you know, shot of whiskey, he might not have had the balls to say some of the things that he said or wrote what he wrote. And it's like, but I think that, you know, people should, if they got to get themselves figured out first and then mm-hmm. know how they can handle that. Versus, you know, to where to me, I think a lot of those things I was just, in a hurry to try things I wasn't ready for. Does success feel the way you thought it would feel? Well, you know, I think that the, uh, the interesting, um, I'm not sure what you call that when you call it, you know, something's on access, parameters. Mm-hmm. If, if you have a parameter and you've played the sidewalk or you've played a basement party or you've played acoustic at a freaking wedding or something, and then you've, then you've played the parameter all the way to playing a festival to 60,000 people, then you can actually measure things that are going on in between. That maybe the sweet spot is actually playing to 200 people in a club like this where they're all up against the stage and they're all sweating and everybody's having a great time and they know your records and their way into you versus maybe you're playing to 60,000 people and half of those people are only there just because we're supposed to go to do something this summer. They, they just listen to the radio, but they're not die-hard music fans. So you're, you're in two great bands, Missionary Position, Walking Papers. Um, how do, you, how do, you, do you have trouble balancing those two bands with tours or rehearsals yeah. and recording? I like it, man. I like I could play more music. I could do more than I'm doing now if, if the world allows me to. So balancing peop- other people's schedules and other, what getting four people to get to be in a room at the same time and organizing all that is hard. But I'm noticing the thing about me is like sometimes too, it's like I'd rather go to practice and jam when I, you know, so I got to try to find things to work on when I'm not, even if I'm not in their band and say maybe somebody's like thinks I'm not working on their band, but I'm still maybe working on my lyrics to songs that we have. And it's like, I mean, that's all, pretty much all I do. I don't, I mean, besides spending time with my family and making sure that they get the attention that they deserve. It's like, I'm, fascinated by music and songs that's what I and but it's like you know it's like my workout I, I don't always feel like doing it but I always show up that's not what's appealing about music 
that's what's appealing that's what appeals to certain people that are like getting into music because they want that thing so that's like they're destined to fail it, like as far as like every, you know and it's not going to the reward's not going to pay so, but people that they get into music because they love music it's not going to matter whether or not they get to you know open for Aerosmith or not whether or not to me it's always been about making a body of work that's still pretty great though yeah, oh no, I'm, I'm I'm totally grateful for it, but I also I also think that it happened. I don't think that that happened for me because I desired it so much. I think it happened for me because I Well, I know why it happened to me because I played music and I was consistently and made records and eventually someone saw the music that I did and they had faith in me and that would be Duff and Barrett who had connections to those kind of people. You could send you could sit there and lick and stick and stamp 600 records and you could send them out and no one's going to get a yeah. rat's ass and I know because I've done it and, and you know I've done it I put out a missionary position record and it re stamped 600 of them and we do alright we'll sell a couple thousand through all the website and stuff CD Baby or something mm -hmm. toured all over the place you know South by Southwest and all that played five shows at South by Southwest Jeez. right and then I go to the walking papers, you play with a couple of these people, all of a sudden people pay attention. So it's like they gave us access. They gave the music that I was writing access. They allowed their audience to see what I was doing. And, and so, you know, I'm super thankful for that. But it wasn't so. It's, and, and more grateful that it's not a businessman that looked at me and was like, I can make money off this kid. They were guys that were like, hey, I like what you're doing. I want to play with you. And, and so to me, that's like I feel better about that than, you know, that's cooler to me than a sports car swimming pool you know to have somebody people that you looked up to creatively admire what you do and and so so you know some people could be like hey you know you're only getting that attention because you're playing with this guy that was in guns and roses but it's like the thing to me it's like yeah i mean i realize that and that, that i get a lot of that attention and that's opened all these doors for me but what they're missing is the that's not what I'm stoked about. What I'm stoked about is there was some guy that I listened to his record when I was a kid and I thought that they ruled and the fact that he looks at what I'm doing and thinks that I'm good enough that he would kill his time to play music with me and there and ex and take chances and invest his time and stuff to me that's what I'm grateful for Jeff thank you so much hey, my awesome brother. man all right buddy. Appreciate everything we talked about oh, man man all right you take care you have a good one all right all right, listen, everybody. We're going to say goodbye to Jefferson Angel. Thanks for watching Strangely All Right TV. We're going to be back again next month, and we hope to see you here. Thanks, everybody. See you later, right? See you later. Nom 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 n